so you're a strange looking doctor witnessing Earth's mightiest heroes in action, when all of a sudden a gigantic purple being whips out a gauntlet with an infinity symbol on it and points it at the moon and yeets it at you. Now you, as calm as a feather, close your eyes and activate your time stone to take a trip into the past to learn about vectors. Now on your journey you find yourself aboard a ship named the Flying Dutch Math. The captain approaches you and hands you over a map, and since you're so curious, you open the map and you see the ship and an X on it. Now the captain wants you to tell him how to get to the treasure. According to the map, the treasure is 5 kilometers away and in the northeast direction. So you roll on over and tell the captain to head northeast and travel 5 kilometers. But if you had just told the captain to travel 5 kilometers, then the ship could have ended up in any direction and not at the treasure. If you just tell the captain northeast, the ship could end up crashing into the treasure at full speed, which would be a bad day for everyone. So you need to convey more than one thing to describe something, and this is a vector. Now, a vector is an object with more than one value that describes something, and in mathematics, that something is usually size or magnitude, for example, given by the size of the arrow, and direction, such as the direction the arrow is pointing in. Now, there are two ways to represent vectors. One is geometrical, which is just that arrow, and the other is mathematical. Now, before we can continue with vectors, we need to talk about scalars, which you've seen throughout your life. Now, scalars are just numbers like 3 or pi or even e. All of these are scalars. Now, when you were a young cub, you learned how to add, take away, multiply, and even divide scalars. And you can think of vectors as a new entity. So we need to know how operations work on any vector. But before we can even do that, we need to talk about standardized vectors. Now in the scalar world, we deal with the decimal system, which is the standardized system. However, there are other systems like binary and hexadecimal, and we can perform operations on all of these systems. However, you can see that the non-standardized system doesn't really make much sense, as we're not used to 9 plus 7 equaling 10. Now, the standardized system for vectors are known as Cartesian vectors, which you may have already seen before. So let's draw some axes and let's plot the coordinates to 1. Now, when you were first plotting coordinates years ago, you actually weren't told the full story. This is actually a vector, and particularly the vector to 1. Now, the 2 refers to how much you move along the x-axis, and the 1 is for the y-axis, the same as the coordinate, and together they give our vector. And this is our standardized vector, just like the decimal system for numbers. Now, you can see the geometrical views look the same, but the mathematical view is different to what we had before. If we wrote the vector like we did before, it would be northeast, and 2.2 kilometers. But with that said, vectors describe a size and direction, so where is the size and direction in this mathematical vector? It was quite obvious before. Well, let's start with the size, also known as the magnitude. We know that this vector means 2 across and 1 up, and now you can see that we have a triangle and good old Pythagoras can help us out to get the magnitude which in this case is square root 5. So if we had any Cartesian vector where a and b can be any number, then we know the size of the vector is just square root of a squared plus b squared. Now, what about the direction? Now, if we take a look at our trusty old map, we open it up and we see that we used the cardinal northeast-southwest system. But instead, what we could do is use an angle between our vector and a reference, which for northeast would be 45 degrees. Now, as the vector changes direction, we can see that the angle changes. So what we can do is say that the vector's direction is based on this angle here. We could also use the angle from the y-axis, like on our map, but 
This is less common, so let's stick with the angle between the vector and the x-axis. And we know by trigonometry that this is just the arc tangent of B over A. So now you might be thinking, why not just stick with the original vector where we stated the direction and length, you know, the northeastern five kilometers? Well, vectors like this are called polar vectors, just like polar coordinates. And usually we write the size or magnitude at the top and the direction of the vector at the bottom. Of course, the Cartesian way of writing this vector will be different, but still represents the same geometrical shape. And the reason why we take the Cartesian vector almost always over every other type of vector is because of adding and subtracting vectors. Now let's see what it looks like geometrically at first when we add or subtract vectors because as we saw the geometrical arrow is the same regardless of Cartesian or polar or any other version of the mathematical vector we wish to write. So let's take a vector and call it U and we normally write vectors with a bold letter that is underlined. And let's take another vector and let's call it V. Now, what would U plus V look like? Now, remember that vectors have a size and a direction, but they don't actually have an origin. So this vector V is the same as this vector V, which is the same as this vector and so on. And the reason for this is that all of these vectors have the same size and direction, so we can move it around wherever we want. So vectors don't have an origin, but it's actually kind of useful to use an origin like we've done here. And we can move the vector around wherever we want. So let's get back to our two vectors and imagine a ship that moves along the vector U. Now, having moved along U, imagine now you want to move along the vector V. Now, you could now say that the origin is now here as we're starting from there. And finally, we move along the vector V. Well, all of this is just the same as moving directly from the start to the end. And this yellow vector is our U plus V. Now, we could have started with the vector V and then moved along U, and we would actually get the same result. So V plus U is the same as U plus V. Now, the next question you might ask is, what about subtraction or U minus V? Well, we can actually leverage off of adding vectors like we did before, since U minus V is the same as U plus minus V. So what is minus V? Well, suppose you have the vector V equal to 2, 1, which would look like this then we could say that the vector minus v is minus 2, 1. And since that minus is like multiplying by the scalar minus 1, then we have minus v is equal to minus 2, minus 1. Which, if we end up drawing, is just the same vector, just in the opposite direction. So a negative vector is the same as the original vector, just in the opposite direction. So let's go back and draw the vector minus v. Then u plus minus v would be like going along u, then along minus v. Then the vector straight to that point is u minus v. And in case it can seem confusing, you can rewrite the vector u plus v as w. Now, this can help with subtraction, because if u minus v is equal to the vector x, then u is equal to v plus x. Then, using the idea of addition, x must be the vector going from the end of v to the end of of u. But now let's take a look at the more straightforward mathematical view. If we have the Cartesian vector 2, 1 and want to add the vector 1, 3, then all you have to do is just add the top and bottom elements separately to give you 3, 4. And notice that we can actually do this in any order, showing that same idea before that u plus v and v plus u are the same. Now we can do the same thing with subtraction, just subtract the top and bottom rows separately. 
Now we can actually see that adding the top and bottom rows separately makes sense geometrically. If we have the vector u equal to 1, 3, which means we go 1 across and 3 up, and then we move across v, which is 2 across and 1 up, then you can see the final vector would be the same as going 3 across and 4 up. So what's wrong with adding vectors with a polar system? That is, the one with the distance and direction as its elements. Well, if you add the top and bottom rows separately, we always end up with some crazy vectors that don't actually make any sense. In order to actually add these two vectors, we need to convert them to Cartesian vectors first, then add, and then finally convert back to polar. And if you're curious on how you would actually do this, check out our free problem sheet linked in the description below. Now, when you first dealt with numbers, you first learned how to add, and once you've done that, you're told that a nice way to write multiple additions is multiplication. And we can actually do the same thing with vectors. Now, we call it scalar multiplication because we're multiplying a scalar or a number to the vector. So 3 times 2, 1 is just 2, 1 added 3 times, which evaluates as 6, 3. So what if we had n times some vector, let's call it a, b? Well, like in your first algebra lessons, you can actually write multiplication without the cross sign. And you can see that if you added this vector n times, then you would add the top and bottom rows n times, which is just the same as multiplying the top and bottom rows by n. So for example, if you had 8 times 5 minus 4, instead of adding 5 minus 4 8 times, which is the same as adding 5 8 times and then minus 4 8 times, this is just the same as multiplying 5 by 8 and minus 4 by 8, giving us 40 minus 32. And geometrically, it's quite simple to see what happens as we just add the same vector multiple times. So in this example, we would just be multiplying the original vector by 3. And you can see that the final vector is in the same direction, but just three times longer. Now, you know how to multiply a scalar or number to a vector, but what about a vector multiplied by a vector? Well, it's actually not so simple. There's actually a few ways we can do this, so we take a look at this in our next video on the dot and cross products. Now, there's one final useful thing we can do with all the knowledge that we've gained so far, and that's the good old straight line equation. Yes, that old y equals mx plus c. Now, we know that any two points define a straight line, and classically, we would write this line as y equal to minus x plus 8. But we saw earlier that these points are just vectors. So we can actually create a vector line equation that outputs a vector or point to anywhere and only on this line. So we still need our two points or vectors in order to do this. And we can imagine our ship once again, and if we move along the vector 4, 4, well, then fantastic, we're already at the line but we want to output any point along the line doing this. So the ship needs to move along the actual line. So how would we find the vector that moves along the line? And whatever that vector is, we want a smaller or larger version of that vector, depending on which point along the line we want. Now, this is the same as multiplying that vector by a scalar. And note that the scalar or number would just be negative in the opposite direction and positive in the other direction. So we know that our vector line equation should start with the vector that we moved along first, and then we add or move along the green vector to get anywhere else along the line. So you can see that our output vector ends at any point along the line. Fantastic. So we have our equation, but what is that vector x, y? Well, recall that we had a second vector, 6, 2. And let's just get rid of the lambda here, as it doesn't make much of a difference. And you can see that the blue vector plus the green vector is actually equal to 6, 2. Then rearranging, we see that the vector x, y is 2 minus 2. 
And this gives us our full line equation. So, well, how do we use it? Well, if we input different values of lambda, we get different values of points along the line. And actually, if we started with the other vector, 6, 2, and we end up with the same direction vector as this vector still moves anywhere along the line, we would just have a slightly different scaling factor, let's call it lambda tilde. And you can see that when lambda tilde is 1, we get the same value as the above equation when lambda is minus 1. So if we had any two vectors, call them a and b, then the straight line through those two vectors is equal to one of those vectors plus the difference between the two vectors multiplied by some scaling factor. And you can see that this is actually way easier than y equal to mx plus c. Finally, just like y is a function of x in y equals mx plus c, r, which is just the output vector, is a function of lambda. So if we input different values for lambda, we get different vectors along the line. And you can see that this looks quite like y equal to mx plus c. Now one last thing to talk about is vector notation, as there's so many ways to write vectors. So say we have a vector and call it a. This is actually how we refer to the vector in our mathematics, and it's written bold and underlined. But sometimes you'll just see it written bold or with an arrow above the letter. One final and quite common way is to assume that the vector points to a point called capital A. Then the vector can be written O capital A with an arrow above it, which essentially means a vector going from O to capital A. Now, we'll talk about the elements of the vector next. Let's assume the vector is 4 across and 3 up. Then we can write this vector in the classic coordinate way or even matrix style. Now, within physics, you might see the i and j notation. Now, the i and j are bold and underlined, and the i refers to how much we move along that x-axis. In reality, i is actually the vector 1, 0, and the j refers to how much you move along the y-axis, and in reality, it is the vector 0, 1. So 4i means 4 times 1, 0, which is just 4, 0. And 3j means 3 times 0, 1, which is just 0, 3. And adding them together gives 4, 3. And similar to the i and j notation, you'll see e1, e2 notation. This is usually seen in research papers, or if you go to study any of Einstein's work, like general relativity. Now, you can pick and choose whichever notation you prefer in your working. Now, it's also good to mention the notation of the size or magnitude, as this is one of the definitions of a vector. Normally, we refer to the magnitude of a vector with two vertical bars. So, the magnitude or length of this vector is 5 by Pythagoras theorem. And we can replace any reference to the vector inside the vertical bars, and it will mean the same thing. You might also see it written with a double bar. You can choose which you prefer. Now, finally, with the direction or angle, there isn't actually any direct common notation. So, you can make up anything you want. Now, the reason why we use vectors, the most powerful thing about them, is being able to use them for multiple dimensions, and still being able to apply everything you've already learnt. Now, if you're close to your exams or want to get fluent in vectors, we strongly recommend that you check out our free problem sheet in the description below. We try to go through all of the types of questions you would get in an exam with full worked answers. And now, after everything you've learnt, you know exactly what you need to do. Now, if you guys learned anything, hit that like button. If you haven't already, subscribe and head over to mathc.com for problem sheets, notes, and more of our videos.